When it comes to repairing something that's broken outside of warranty, there are, frankly, several different types of people. There are those who, the minute something breaks, decide to throw it in the rubbish or trash for all you Americans in a fit and then decide to buy a replacement. There are those who will return the item to the original manufacturer and try to get it repaired, either through an official repair program offered by said manufacturer or through a certified repair shop. Depending on the estimate for repair, they will either resort to option one or decide to pay through the nose to get their thing working again. Then there are those who have the Keith Robinson approach to repair. They may not have the skill to fix the thing properly, but they believe in grit and determination and lots of duct tape. Their repairs may or may not work and they may or may not get featured on the popular internet site. There, I fixed it. But finally, there are those for whom repairing their product is a foregone conclusion. They may or may not have the skills or the knowledge at the time they decide to do the repair, but they've got a curious mind, tenacity, and probably a decent grounding from previous DIY repairs. They are happy to learn what they need to do, and they're humbled and educated by their mistakes, and understand that while it can be soul-destroying to have something refuse to work after they've tried to repair it, it can also be thoroughly satisfying to look at that thing and go, I fixed that. They'll happily change the wheel on a car, open up a broken computer, or if they are feeling really fancy, get out the test equipment to try and scare their garage door opener into working. And while they may acknowledge that it can sometimes be faster to sometimes resort to option one or two, and that it sometimes is a safer solution when they could break the thing they're trying to repair even more, they are ultimately willing to put in sweat equity in place of financial outlay. And when they know they've been beaten with a repair, they generally have a more considered approach when it comes to deciding to pay someone else to fix it or ultimately to replace the item. It's that final group of people, a group that I think myself and the whole team here, both Kate, Erin and Morgan, all consider ourselves part of, that are at the heart of the right to repair movement. The idea that if you own something, you should also be able to repair it when things go wrong. That you should be able to buy replacement parts, obtain service manuals, and not be faced with a throwing of something out because a $5 part has ultimately failed. That call to be able to repair things rather than throw them away has gained some significant traction in recent years following some pretty high profile cases. John Deere has rightly come under criticism for preventing farmers from repairing their tractors and expensive combine harvesters and even stopping them from tweaking vehicle settings. The reason? Claims that under the Digital Copyright Millennium Act, the farmers may own their vehicles but the software that runs on them is owned and copyrighted by John Deere. We've all seen similar claims from across the electronic world. Apple has long been known as an adversary for right to repair. And even though recent suggestions were that it might be opening its access to some repair resources, it's still very much a closed ecosystem. The iPhone 12, for example, is so locked down in its software and hardware that simply replacing a broken camera module with another genuine part is enough to cause it to not function correctly. And of course, in the automotive world, we have Tesla, a company that has traditionally eschewed any notion that its vehicles should be repairable by those who own them. It has consistently fought right to repair legislation most recently unsuccessfully asking the residents of Massachusetts to vote against a ballot measure aimed to give third-party shops and owners access to its over-the-air diagnostics. And Tesla has been pretty notorious about locking down access to parts for its vehicles. Added to that, it's vowed to lock out any salvage retitled Tesla from its supercharger network, its blacklisted cars in an attempt to prevent them from coming back to life, and it's threatened legal action against those who try to circumvent these lockouts. Over the weekend, well-known white hat security expert and Tesla hacker Green the Only noted on Twitter that Tesla appeared to be making its repair manuals and diagnostics tools free to access for customers in China. You simply registered an account with Tesla.cn and it seemed to give you access to a wealth of information that was previously kept under lock and key. 
Yet almost as soon as word of this spread, it was shut down, with Tesla closing that particular loophole. Which raises the question, if Tesla is so eager to get the world transitioning to zero emission transportation and energy, and famously made all of its technology available to rival companies under a quid pro quo open source agreement, why does it appear to be so anti-right to repair? Today, I'm going to try and answer that using what I know of Tesla and of Elon Musk. And to be clear, even though I will examine possible reasons, I personally support the right to repair. In this case, however, it is my job not to say if Tesla is right or wrong, but to give possible reasons as to its stance. Before we get to that, though, I feel it's important to reiterate the whole all our patents are belong to you notion. While Tesla has made all of its patents available to other automakers out there, the legal wording of its agreement that companies would have to enter into in order to use Tesla's own proprietary designs, as well as its charging network, isn't just as simple as using your run-of-the-mill, open-source, free-as-in-speech software. And it puts the brakes on anyone trying to offer replacement third-party patent parts for Tesla vehicles, as is common with most other vehicles out there. It essentially means that any company seeking to use Tesla's patents would both have to agree not to sue any other companies for patent infringement when it comes to electric vehicle technology, but must also not make any product that they produce from Tesla patents appear that it's either a Tesla product or has endorsement from the company. The language for this agreement is so vague, it doesn't really help. Anyway. Let's get to why Tesla might not be a fan of right to repair. And remember, I'm not excusing, but giving potential reasons that Tesla could and do argue. In fact, for each potential reason, I am going to try and come up with a counter argument. First, there is, of course, the company's reputation to think of. Tesla is a world leader in electric vehicles. It's often put on a pedestal, both as a leader for automakers to emulate and, when things don't go according to plan, subjected to serious negative press. Its cars are complicated. Its technology might be streets ahead of the competition in many regards, but it's complicated. And allowing third-party repairers or owners to work on their own vehicles might, Tesla could argue, lead to people incorrectly fixing their vehicles, which could lead to negative press when things go wrong. And let's be fair to Tesla here. It has been subjected to a lot of negative press over the years, so I can understand at one level while Tesla is loath to let people tinker with their vehicles, especially when there are onboard systems which, when not properly operated, could cause serious injury or death. I'm talking about repairing autopilot hardware or working on the supercharger-capable power electronics. In response to this, I'd respectfully suggest that every other automaker out there seems to let owners and third parties work on their cars without too many issues. And when it comes to electric vehicles, which are still very much a cutting edge technology in the automotive world as a whole, most automakers have come up with a workaround. Namely that in order to get high voltage replacement parts from the automaker, You need to be a fully certified repair facility who is trained to work on high voltage components. But when it comes to getting things like brake components, suspension and other more benign parts, well, it's far less restricted for most companies. But not for Tesla. Everything is pretty much locked down. Tesla's risk aversion to third party repairers and owner repairers could also explain why Tesla doesn't want salvage cars retitled. Again, It just takes one wrong component or incorrectly fitted part to cause any number of issues that could be detrimental to the brand's reputation and lead to a lot of negative press. But sadly, there's a flip side to this. By restricting parts and repair equipment, Tesla may be actually making third party and owner executed repairs worse, as owners who aren't willing to pay Tesla to work on their vehicle are left looking for salvage used replacement parts or even worse, trying to make their own. This is made worse by the fact that unlike most car companies who tend to change parts for vehicles a few times over that vehicle's lifetime, or perhaps only change parts when their supplier changes every few years, Tesla rolls out improved parts all the time. Those improved parts are great for owners, but for repairers, third party or owner carried out, it's sometimes difficult to figure out exactly which part your vehicle needs. 
Most automakers do have a part lookup by VIN number that's accessible to anyone online. And this makes it easy for enthusiasts and independents to order and fit the correct part. Restricting access to this component list keeps third parties and owners out of the loop and forces them to face a choice between a large repair bill or trying to come up with their own solution, often with salvage parts. Then, of course, there's the risk of cyber attacks. Teslas are incredibly advanced vehicles with lots of programming and software driven functionality. Restricting who can and can't work on cars and restricting parts availability does mean that Tesla can ensure its vehicles and its wider network is less likely to be the victim of malicious attacks or Trojan horses, sometimes even in the form of hidden code embedded in non authentic parts. Again, the safety risks and the cybersecurity risks, not to mention the potential negative headlines, are majorly problematic. So closing down access helps prevent all of this before it happens. Another reason Tesla has the approach it does to repairers is, of course, the people at Tesla, including Elon. He's well known for being um, hands on and wanting to have control of the entire process. That attention to detail and desire to handle every aspect of the vehicle from its design through to the charging network and even, yes, how the machines operate that build the production line means that Tesla has been able to accelerate its factories and its vehicle output at a blistering rate. In that regard, Tesla's closed system has actually helped rather than hindered it. But for those looking for third party and independent repair, not so much. Those who know Elon say that the engineers and Elon himself at Tesla support as much openness as possible when it comes to vehicle design. And we've certainly seen that enough from Elon when he wants open source and open discussion of EV tech to know that that's true. But those in charge of service and parts? Well, several sources I've talked to suggest that those responsible for Tesla's service and after sales network are loath to open it up, partly, say some sources, because Tesla's own diagnostic equipment isn't all that simple to use. And because Tesla does change parts frequently, far more frequently than most car companies, it can be harder to diagnose and identify faults and the correct components. It's fairly regular to hear of Tesla service people quietly complaining in hushed tones about software issues. Opening that up to the public would just make things a whole lot worse. And then there's a the matter of keeping everything in stock and making it accessible to the public. This requires a whole separate team of people to deal with non Tesla service folks and owners. And that's a big investment. Sure. Tesla is now trading above $600 per share. It's raking in the pennies and it has a very rosy future, but it's already pushing its teams to the max. Adding in customer facing parts service would theoretically push that already stretched team even further. Right now, most Tesla owners are content with having Tesla work on their vehicles. Tesla's after sales service experience has been improving by all accounts in recent years. And while you do sometimes steer here the odd horror story about replacement parts, especially for those outside of the US, most service centers are becoming pretty competent and smooth in their operation. But while it works having the automaker's own service teams work on a vehicle when it's nearly new and repairs are either done for free under warranty or the owners are willing to pay out of pocket for repairs, that changes as the car ages. As it gets older, it becomes more of an issue without putting too much of a fine point on it, by the time the car is on its third or fourth owner, the chances are that owner is going to be more interested in saving money on maintenance than the car's original owners were. They're going to be driven to try and save money and to try and repair their vehicles themselves. I know I'm making wild generalizations here, so I do apologize, but simply put, as the car's sticker price drops, the cost of servicing it needs to similarly drop, or it is a pretty false economy. And in order for Teslas and other similarly advanced vehicles to become affordable for people who are looking for a cheap, affordable runabout, then the parts and service restrictions need to be more manageable. The same goes for Nissan and its incredibly high battery replacement costs. When that doesn't happen, well, you're left with the prospect of high-end cars like Teslas ultimately becoming enthusiast-only vehicles. And that won't help people make the transition to cleaner forms of transportation, especially where it's most needed, the more affordable end of the used car market. And while we're focusing on Tesla, the same is true for some other companies out there too. 
Is there a solution? Yes, I think there is. But it involves trusting third party repairers and Tesla enthusiasts who just want to work on their own cars to do a good job. Maybe it will require folks to take a simple online test to prove they at least understand how to use the software and understand the basic skills needed to fix their vehicle. Or Tesla could just be brave and open the floodgates. And maybe, just maybe, it won't be the car crash that some executives at Tesla believe it will be. Ultimately, right to repair can help prevent things from ending up in landfill. It can reduce e-waste and it can extend operational life of perfectly adequate products. A good example of this, my Roomba vacuum cleaner. We purchased this in 2008 from our local Costco in Bristol. And thanks to Roomba's very forward thinking approach to repair and aftermarket parts, I've been able to replace things as they failed like the wheels, I've upgraded the battery and even added a new brush box, which has a newer design than the original and it's more efficient and doesn't get clogged up so easily. And this is still going 13 years after we bought it every single night. And if my robotic vacuum cleaner, complete with its aftermarket Wi-Fi control board and official replacement parts can operate for 13 years and still has official parts availability, even when the company that sold it is selling brand new units that are six generations more advanced than mine, well, then I want a car that can operate with that same level of ease when it comes to repair. Don't you? That's it for today. As always, thanks to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month Patreon supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month Patreons, that's John Lyons, Ray Jean Fellows, Jeffrey Songster and Tesla in the Gong. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters. That's Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, JP Fagerback, Sean Ueda, Will Grelin and Ian. You can join all of these amazing Patreon supporters by following the links below, or you can send us a donation through Ko-fi or Bitcoin. You'll also find a link to our free Discord server, so if you haven't yet, please sign up and come and join in the chat fun. And if you're in need of some swag, do check out our merch over at Redbubble. I think you're probably too late now to buy something for the holidays, but still, it's a great way to support the channel while buying yourself some great tea swag. After the names have finished scrolling, you'll see a suggestion for a new video, so please consider watching it if you haven't, and I'll be back very soon. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving. <laughs> <laughs>